Well, welcome everyone to the Coyote Creek Watershed Tour. Um, we are going to be focusing on the spread wing seep, which you will learn where it is and what makes it so special. I will share the beauty of the creek environments and stories of people who enjoy Coyote Creek and the nature in Southern San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, we'll be sharing a spot in Coyote Creek along uh, south in Coyote Valley. And uh, it's been affectionately named the spread wing seep. And it's named after the great spring spread wing damselfly, which was first documented here in Santa Clara Valley by naturalist Marav von Schneck, who's on with us. And during this tour, we'll take a nature walk that includes a bio woods to really showcase some of the tools that we use to take a deeper dive in nature. So hi everyone, um, my name is Deb Kramer. I'm the executive director with Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful and I'll be your moderator for today. I've been out and about um, at our events for Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful over the past seven years. And it's just amazing to see how happy people are when they're outdoors in nature and especially when they get to learn and share what they discover. And that's part of what our bio blitzes do. And our naturalists are some of the most joyful people that I've encountered. So hopefully through um, meeting them uh, through this video, you'll get to also and share their enthusiasm. So this effort is a partnership of Keep Caddy Creek Beautiful with BioBlitz.club and naturalists who enjoy sharing their love of nature. And our sponsors are the city of San Jose and Santa Clara County Parks. We're really grateful to them to provide us with this opportunity to create these um, these videos. So a little bit about Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. We're a community-based organization that works with many groups, agencies, and partners towards a vibrant Coyote Creek with clean waters, abundant wildlife, and natural beauty that everyone can enjoy. And some of the things that we do are we host um, uh, creek and trail cleanups and biowoods events, which you're experiencing virtually, and nature walks, as well as we've had some bike rides around the creek. And we do some restoration activities, which is, we just had our last one in partnership with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. We also provide classroom education for all ages. BioBlitz Club is a citizen science organization to encourage people to get outside and learn more about nature. Through this group's actions over the nearly past five years, they've hosted over 60 events, but well over a thousand people have participated and contributed to the growing body of knowledge about nature through the iNaturalist tool. So let me orient you towards um, Coyote Creek and where we will be. And here you can see the Coyote Creek map. Um, Coyote Creek actually starts up at Henry Co. Park in the Diablo foothills and makes kind of a backwards J through Anderson Lake, Coyote Valley, goes through downtown San Jose, out through Milpitas and makes a huge left turn out into San Francisco Bay. It's a 64 mile long creek and it has a huge diversity of wildlife as you can imagine from the foothills and the valley, the urban area and also out of the bay. So lots to offer in this area. So taking a little closer look at where we were for the spread wing seep, we were out by the Coyote Creek Visitor Center and it's just below Anderson Dam and you can see also where Coyote Creek Parkway and Highway 85 merge at Highway 101. So that just hopefully orients you around where the Coyote Creek Visitor Center is. And one of the cool things to do is to actually go into the Visitor Center. And this is a picture from Ronald Ory, who is on the, on the, um, one of our naturalists, and he loves showcasing this Visitor Center with other people. It's uh, got a lot of, uh, cool items to see, touch, and hear. So highly recommend that you give that uh, an opportunity or go stop and have an opportunity to view it if you get down in that area, hopefully with one of our bio blitzes. So let's get started with one of our videos. Okay, so I think we're getting ready for our first bio blitz in, in that area in Coyote Creek, uh, in Coyote Valley. And I didn't know the area very well. I visited it a few times. So I went to uh, meet with a local ranger and I asked him if there's any particular places of interest in the area other than where we want to focus for the bio blitz. 
and he pointed out a couple of cool seeps that uh, later join the main Caddy Creek stream, but could be interesting to visit. Um, so yeah, so in October I went to visit one of these places, and I remember it was kind of funny because there's no real trail and. Um, I wasn't sure what I'm going to find there. Just like our visit this time, I was concerned about pigs, which are present in the area and I've seen some. I got to this little peaceful area, which was really cool because it was very different than the main uh, creek. So there was a lot of uh, damsel fire activity. And one was especially interesting it's called a spread wing the great spread wing damselfly and it's interesting because you could quickly see that they hold their wings in a different way so uh that was cool and I documented that and later on when i uploaded a photo then someone identified as the great spread wing damselfly and another damselfly expert mentioned that it's the first uh finding of this species in uh, Santa Clara County, which is pretty cool. And she suggested to uh, update the online databases for Odonata, for uh, dragonfly and damselflies, uh, because this is the first record, so that was cool. So it was a, a fun finding, and I thought that could be a good name for that little sip, the spread wing sip. Okay, so we made it on our journey to the sip. Um, to spread wing sip, I should say. Um, and this is when we can go and have a look in the sip and see who lives here in the middle of the summer. Lots of uh, damselfly activity here and very, very clean water as we usually see. So yeah, let's see who we can find inside. This is one of the creatures that I was looking for. Well, obviously this is a rock, but if you look very very closely you will find tiny tiny round little things so this one this is a water penny beetle lava so it's a it's a little beetle um, and the lava lives in fresh water but only in the cleanest water in coyote valley for example this is the only place we've seen it so far so in order to take photos though we should get much closer with this little uh, macro lens Oh, and there's some other creatures here as well. There's some uh, flatworms, which actually don't care at all um, about the water quality. So you'd find them here, but you'd also find them downtown San Jose where the water is not clean at all. Uh, maybe I'll take a video. We usually see near our creeks are dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, damselflies are easier to identify because at rest their wings are against their body like that. Dragonflies they are perpendicular. Um, also they look much slimmer the damselflies. Um, the cool thing about damselflies that a lot of people don't end up noticing is uh, so some, of, some of the uh, damselflies you can tell if it's a male or a female just by the color. Males have bluish color, females are drab, um, grayish in color. Uh, but the thing that I want to talk about today is not the damselflies or the idea of the damselflies, is something that you'll see in other types of insects called uh, uh, praying mantis or mantids as well. And so if you look at the eye, right now it looks like as if the damselfly is looking at you. But if we flip it like that, it still looks like the damselfly is looking at you. The same thing, if I flip it like that, it looks like the damselfly is looking at you. And so if there are six people who take a picture, in each of their pictures, it will look like the pupil is actually looking at uh, the person taking a photo of the damselfly. And how is that possible? How can a pupil quickly switch directions that fast or the position? And uh, the cool thing about that is it's not a pupil. It's a pseudo pupil so it's actually an optical illusion 
and so the way light hits it and the person who perceives that light that spot actually ends up absorbing the light uh, sorry that spot yeah and so that's why you see that dark black spot which resembles a pupil but it's not a pupil so it feels like the silver is looking at you but it's not you're not no no you're not a special person it's just the, an illusion all right so the damsel fly we saw earlier the drab grayish color one was a female this is a male another way you can actually tell the difference between males and females is you want to look at the tip of their abdomen their long abdomen and for males you might see these claspers that they actually use to hold the female by her neck while mating and make her lay eggs and so that's like really prominent in the males which is not in the females so even if you don't remember the color if you just look at their body shape and towards the end of their body if you see those claspers that are just the right width to hold a female and uh, hold her in place so she doesn't escape all right so um i hope you guys enjoyed that and at this time what we can do is have any questions that folks might want to um, share. Thanks, Katrina. Katrina, yeah, that was um, a really nice little presentation by Marav and Karan about the um, damselflies. So just feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask them any questions. If we're feeling shy, I have a question. <laughs> Um, and I see that uh, the man himself is here, uh, Karan Kanthani. I wanted to ask, why have a pseudo pupil? What's what's the point? Why would why an insect want to have a pseudo pupil like that? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, this is something that they end up choosing. Like I said, I've seen that in praying mantis as well. Um, I mean, like I, I know like a lot of uh in a lot of like butterflies you have like these eye spots that are supposed to um make you think that uh it is aware of your presence and stuff like that. My best guess would be that it would be something uh similar wherein it is trying to show you that it is aware of your presence and stuff like that. So uh I would assume that would be uh the case. Uh like I said, I don't know really what's the reason but like that's my best guess what it might be uh like the same thing with butterflies that like uh, with the eye spots i don't think we ever had a butterfly who said why they have those spots we are just making educated guesses so hey this is ron hey i, I have a guess as to why that how that works so insects have compound eyes right and so it's a whole bunch of different, um, you know, like cylindrical elements that are arranged in a sphere, like on the surface of a sphere. And you can, you can imagine a bunch of tubes on the outside of a ball. And, if, and inside the tubes would be black, let's say. So if you look at this ball, anytime you're looking down at the tubes, it'll look dark. But if you're looking at it from an angle, you'll see the sides of those tubes and it'll be light or maybe the surface of it or the ends of it or something like that. So that could, that could be how that happens and it's probably not intentional. That's cool. Thanks Ron for sharing that. As we walked towards the seep, we saw that the soil had been turned over as we've seen when wild boar are around. Then we noticed the movement in the grass and assumed it was a wild boar, but it was going away from us. So we made a note and continued on. After some time, Deb smelled a musky scent when we were investigating some plants, then saw movement of a large animal in the common fig. We decided to move into the grassy area so we could run better when alas, we saw a small herd of wild boar, including some juveniles, run just in front of us and up the hillside. These feral pigs are a nuisance, but also a danger due to tusks in their size. If you encounter one, make loud noise and wave your hands to scare them away. This is a pretty big fig tree over here. And this fig tree is definitely a cultivated variety, common fig. 
um, that you might find in your backyard or something. But it still provides a lot of food and habitat for birds and for insects. Um, so even though it's not native, it still provides a lot to the ecosystem here in the sea. Tell me some of your tips and tricks for using a mobile phone and getting okay. a decent picture. So, so uh, if you look at a flower or something, there may be something on the flower that you want. It's maybe like on a tall stalk, and you may want to take a picture of there's a bee, a little bee or a native bee or something on it. And uh, if you if you try and go move in on it without having a set focus, it, it it's really hard to get the camera the, the phone to focus on that flower. So what you do is you, you open up a window for taking a picture and then you put your finger out maybe six inches or so from it. And then you, then you press your, when it's in focus, you press your finger and hold it down on the screen on, the, on that focus. And it'll automatically lock that focus at like six inches. And then what happens is, is now it's gone. You'll see the little, the little yellow symbol that says auto lock. And, uh, and then what happens is, is then when you see the bee there, you just keep moving it in and then it'll focus on that distance and that'll give you the flower in focus and the bee. And then you can take your pictures and, uh, and uh, rather than trying to chase the flower and having it focus and not scare the, the thing you're taking a picture of away. So, but that's a little secret. There's a little... Yeah, you can hear birds in the trees. You can hear the water running underneath. You can record sound on iNaturalist. If you go to observe, you can just record a sound. So once you record the sound, you can upload it, and then other people can ID the sound and help you figure out what bird it was you heard. So we're in a, a, a seep here, and a uh, seep is different. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of creeks uh, form by being at the base of mountains where and, and when the moisture collects there in the mountains it runs down and into the creek and the creek runs down to, to the ocean pretty much most of the time and uh, or a lake and uh, and what happens with the seep though the seep is actually it doesn't depend on rain uh, so much it's it's coming the water is actually coming from underground an underground source of water so it can go year round it can it can you know it can be independent of of uh, what the seasons are doing and what the weather's doing, if you know, uh, but it's it's a it's a very natural. It's it's one of those things that if you ever followed it up, you'd actually come to a point where you it would be where it's coming out of the out of the mountain. Okay, so so neat neat interesting thing is like if you look here, we're we're near the the seep in the creek that's here, and uh, and you look everything around it looks like this back over here it's all dry hot and dry uh the, the grass is you know seasonal grass right all the all the most of the grasses that we see now around here um on the hills we get brown hills now it didn't used to be that way uh, pretty much um when uh you know our native plants that were here before the spanish came they were usually they had adapted to the hot environment so they had deeper roots in the ground so that they could reach the groundwater. So they were green. The hills were mostly green uh, during during the, the year round, right? And uh, when the Spanish came, uh, they came they came from Southern California where they landed and such, and came forward. They brought cattle, and they and and on their uh, on their trips they brought hay from Europe, and and it's and it's one that you know it's it's not a year round plant, but it grows faster. So it outcompeted the native plants. And uh, now our, our, our beautiful hills are all because of all the hay and stuff that were brought by the Spanish, right? So that changed the, the, the diversity. Uh, but the, uh, you see it, it's hot and dry. Um, the grass obviously dies off and stuff. The water, if you look at the other side, the habit, that's one habitat, the, 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 the dry area, the woodland with oaks and such. And then you look over back this direction where we've got the, the seep and water coming down and you get a whole different set of trees growing here and, uh, and plants, yeah, beautiful diversity of plants and such along the creek, which brings in 
you know, you have water, which, which is what insects need uh, to, to lay their eggs in. So you have a place for the insects to be, so there's plenty of insects. And you have shelter in the trees and such, so birds will come in and birds will feed on the adult insects when they start flying uh, out of the creek. And uh, you get this whole little ecosystem going, um, you know, and you've got, you've got the butterflies and the pollinators in here. And uh, you get a lot of real neat uh, diversity. And so this, this little stretch amongst all the hills here, it's like a little oasis. And, uh, but it shows you that, you know, what the, what the habitat how much of a difference the, having some water and the, and, the, and the habitat in a particular area contributes to, you know, it's got its own habitat, but it also contributes to things that live, live in the, the really dry habitat, right? So this is kind of like a little uh, area of euphoria, right? And uh, so it's, it's very neat to see. It's really neat to see in the diversity, just sitting and watching and things go by and doing what they do uh, is, is an incredible, you know, and once you see it, you'll always remember it, right? So it's, it's important to do that. So here we have the California sagebrush. Um, it is a common chaparral plant. Um, it's usually seen with its sort of pale green, almost yellowy leaves. If you ever find one, you can rub the leaf and smell your hands, and it smells pretty delightful. Fun fact about the, sun, the sagebrush is that it's not actually a true sage. Um, uh, true sages, they have sort of square stems, and if you feel the stem on this one, it is rather round. Um, but it does have a similar smell to sage, so that's probably the origin of its name. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, this is an elderberry tree, and it's a, it's a native of California. Uh, by native, we mean it's evolved here, so it's adapted to the environment. Native indigenous people would use the berries for consumption. Uh, a great habitat tree also, it provides lots of berries for all kinds of birds and other animals when it falls, when they get knocked on the ground and such. Um, it's, you know, does pretty well because it's evolved here, it's, it's better adapted to our environment. And with, you know, the changing heating and, uh, or warming that we're having going on, um, you know, it's got a better chance of surviving in this environment than the trees that so many trees that we've planted that haven't evolved here, right? And so uh, they're, they're, this is this is a, a great habitat tree. So if you have these in your yard, or you, you plant these, or you have them near you, you'll you'll see all kinds of wildlife, bugs, insects, and the things that eat those things showing up as well. And you get you get the whole food chain going, and see all kinds of really neat stuff in in, the, in your area. So can you eat them? Do people do um, anything with you them can't, today? You, you can't pick, well, you can pick them and eat them if you're desperate. Um, but usually um, what they do, you can make like elderberry wine, they call it, right? You, you can take, you can take these, one these, these are, these are very small right now, but they'll plump up later in the year. And, uh, and uh, people do make, you know, uh, stuff out of them, jams and things. Um, you have to uh, boil them, right? So like you would do any other thing, you know, boil them really well and soft and mushy and, and uh, it's a lot of work, right? So, so you know, uh, if you can find somebody who's already done it and, uh, and you try theirs, uh, you'll understand what, you know, it tastes like and then you'll have a better idea if you ever want to try that yourself. That's, that's, that's my logic. So we have a few uh, cool plants here in the seed. We have this hedge nettle from the mint family. And we have a nice tall plant, lots of little white flowers. And then we have the beautiful sip 
monkey flower, which is a species of monkey flower we always see where there's even a tiny bit of water in the ground, we might see some of that along our creeks. So they really need water. Same with the swims. And then this shade here comes from a huge valley oak, some coast live oak, uh, blue elder, um, walnut trees, and fig trees. There's no native uh, fig trees here. Just a um, woodpecker flying. But I'm not sure where it is. So, yeah, some cool plants. And they attract some butterflies, there's some white butterflies flying around, of course never stopping. And then lots of different benzoflies flies that are here for the water and for the bugs they can catch. That looks really great. Uh, nice overview of the habitats. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to share? Uh, I know for me, the coyote was one of the highlights of going out there. I don't get to see a coyote very often in um, along Coyote Creek. So that was pretty exciting. And Ron was with me as well as some of the other people who are attending mm -hmm. the bio park. Um, so I just like to make a comment. Uh, you know, along the, the base of the Coyote Ridge there, um, this is, you know, that whole area, that flat area there is, next, is near a winery that was there a long time ago, the Malgara Winery. And, um, you know, it, it had a long history of occupation for agriculture and, and other things. So you see a lot of non-native things um, that were, that reflect its kind of its past history. Like a little bit farther down along uh, the, uh, the hills, you can see a whole big patch of cacti. And I think they're prickly pears. And it's uh, planted there probably for food a long time ago. And then about a half a mile from the winery, you see this forest, this really dense forest. And it's just one kind of clump of forest right against the, the hills. And it's like a seep that runs through it. And um, I used to think that was a walnut grove because the trees there, they have the leaves that look like walnuts. And then after I became a CMPS member, I started to learn more about plants. I went back there and I was horrified. Those are trees of heaven. <laughs> It's a massive grove of trees of heaven, which are also called trees of hell, because they're, they're highly invasive and they're very hard to get rid of. And I just hope they don't spread. <laughs> as long as yeah, they stay put, okay, but I hope they don't spread out all over the place. They probably already did, but Deb and I tried to go there to that place with all the tree of heaven. It's like, yeah, it's very dense. And then we heard pigs again and we decided not to go in. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Yeah, but it's, it's a cool area. Um, I had one comment. So in one of the clips you saw, uh, one of the presenters, Rad Radhika, she was recording a sound of a bird. Um, and I took that sound bite, I s put it on a uh, Merlin app. It didn't come back with anything. I sent it out to several ornithologists and it stumped several of them. Um, uh, what the best guess we got back was perhaps a juvenile um, uh, like Stellar's jay or some sort of jay or mockingbird begging for food from its parent. So like a very atypical call. But if anyone has any other thoughts on it, then feel free to let us know. You know who we should have asked was Jennifer Reisinga. She's like the bird audiology specialist just hears like three notes and she'll tell you what bird it is. <laughs> oh, Efren, thanks for sharing that in the chat about um, the silt. Hi. <laughs> okay, so we are standing here in Coyote Valley, not too far away from Coyote Creek Visitor Center near Anderson Reservoir. And this is a really good spot to look for milkweed plants. So this is the narrow leaf milkweed, which is the only native milkweed found in South Bay, naturally. Uh, there are a few other species if you go a bit farther up uh, the mountains on either way. Uh, but around here, this is our native milkweed, which is the main host plant for uh, the monarch butterfly. 
but so which means that the caterpillars of the monarch butterflies would feed on exclusively on milkweed uh, but it's not only for monarch butterflies in the middle of the summer this plant is growing from now it's blooming from now till probably uh, august september even uh, this is the main nectar plant for many butterflies uh, flies beetles uh, so many different insects and other arthropods that use this as their um, nectar resource so this is a really good spot to find different things and just this is the first plant we looked at it's full of ants and that's actually a good thing so these are uh, these ants are called chromatogaster which is a really cool native ant not very common so it's nice to see them and of course if you try looking for ants in a place like this it would be very difficult to find anything because there's just so much grass and you know lots of dried vegetation but if you go to the nectar source then you're much more likely to find interesting bugs so we have the chromatogaster ants or it's also called acrobat ant and then there's a little spider so this is called a Rub spider. We'll try and get a photo, a close-up photo for you in a minute. Uh, many spiders also uh, visit or actually stay on milkweed plants because this is where they can get their food. So they're waiting for pollinators to come and visit the flowers. Uh, we often find um, crab spiders, uh, green lynx spiders, which are beautiful green spiders. We might find ambush bugs, which are true bugs that are also predators waiting for pollinators to come and pollinate the flowers. They are amazing looking, they look just like one of these flowers and they sit between the flowers waiting for a pollinator to come. So the best way to find these predators is to look at the flowers and see if you find a pollinator that looks a bit odd, that looks like it's, you know, sitting in a weird position, which usually means that there's a predator on the other end. It's not actually visiting a flower, but the predator. Okay, so yeah, let's get some close-up photos. And by the way, the monarch butterflies, they lay their eggs, just one or two eggs on each plant uh, so that it's not like we'll find a cluster of eggs of, or a cluster of caterpillars. There'll be maybe one or two, but those are very difficult to find. I don't see any. I do see a bug. So there are a couple of true bugs that uh, specialize on milkweed. So milkweed is a um, pretty poisonous plant. That's why the monarchs eat that, because then they can use that poison to become poisonous themselves. Uh, the same with a bug. So not too many creatures can eat the plant, but uh, the small milkweed bug that I see here specializes on uh, milkweed and, and a few other uh, plants as well. There's another spider hiding underneath the flowers here. And a few more ants. Yeah, it's a different crab spider. Yeah, so let's have a look at this milkweed plant. It's pretty really interesting because it either has these tiny, tiny buds that didn't develop yet or a big seed pod right here. Okay, so later on in the season, they'll all develop uh, these seed pods like these ones. This one has a lot of them and inside there'll be lots of fluff and seeds to make new milkweed.
I'm standing here in Cary Valley, not too far away from Cary Creek, in this huge uh, field of yellow star thistle, which unfortunately is a very bad weed. So this is a, a non-native plant that is very widespread in the area. You can see that it can take over uh, an area. They use a lot of water uh, and not too many animals can actually feed on them. It's not a native plant, so none of our native species is adapted to eating it. But, however, some species actually use its nectar or the seeds. So some birds like eating the seeds. Uh, many insects like to feed on the nectar. Um, it flowers in the middle of the summer when there are not too many other uh, nectar plants available. So you'd often see different bees. We saw a bumblebee, we saw honeybees, which are also not native. Uh, and the other thing I saw here was a weevil. So a few species of weevils, little beetles, were um, released in California in order to biologically control the yellow star thistle. As you can see, they work too slow. So they are doing their best. They are feeding on um, the flower head, so the little eggs and little lava will develop in the flower head. But we probably need a few million more beetles to actually make a difference. But still, it's cool that to see that you know they're around trying to do their part. So I found a praying mantis lady, um, which is very nice to find. It's a female uh, non-native praying mantis because we are here in the middle of the non-native everything. This is a, an adult female praying mantis and you can see it's an adult because it has wings so all winged insects are adults which means that they're not going to molt again insects in order to grow they have to molt multiple times but once they have their wings on some insects won't have wings but once they become adults they don't molt again uh, this one is probably a female because it's kind of fat, it has this um, wide abdomen. The male is narrower than this, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we'll have to check that later, so I'm going to document it and hopefully someone will help us with ID and everything else. Uh, the thing that I noticed pretty quickly is that she has this really cool spot on her Four legs, so you can see that her four legs are very well adapted to um, catching prey. Okay, she has these amazing spines there and everything else. And once she sees something moving, she could um, use her legs to catch it and probably also kill it, and then she would start eating it. And between these two legs, there's a really nice large spot which will help us identify it. Gorgeous. She has large eyes. She sees very, very well. And again, she will notice any little movement. So, this beautiful tall grass here is called herring grass. This is uh, another nasty weed that is widespread in different places in the Bay Area. Uh, it's very difficult to remove. 
you have to kind of dig and cut the roots and everything. Uh, but, you know, here it is. And there's actually not that much of it here. We haven't seen much. So if you have a targeted weeding program, you could get rid of something like that. So another way that people try and control this plant is by hand um, picking, weeding uh, this plant, which I've done for a few years. And it's very difficult. <laughs> it's a very difficult work. You can see now it's very spiky. It's painful even through leather uh, gloves. But earlier in the season, it's much easier and very satisfying to pull them out of the ground. But they are very difficult to remove. They have the seed bank lasts for many years. So even after you remove them for about 10 years, you might still get new seedlings every year. Uh, but some people are amazing and they still do it. And within quite a few years, you can actually clean the preserve like Edgewood, like uh, Westfalia Preserve, different places where they try and have these uh, awesome programs, and, but it's through lots of uh, sweat and hard work of many, many, many volunteers. But I highly recommend joining one of these projects, like the Grassroots Ecology Project, because I think it's it's the best way to learn about invasive species and how difficult it is to deal with them. Okay. Know your weed program, take three. <laughs> so this is another weed, uh, pretty common in the Bay Area, it's called milk thistle. Uh, now it's dry, it has its uh, seed heads here, and if you pull them, you might find this pretty cool seed. So this is a non-native plant, uh, pretty widespread, uh, very difficult to remove, and one of many. Um, Right, you're wrong. Yeah, I kind of wanted to say that I was wrong about the herding grass because when we were standing there, we saw only one plant. But I guess that's where all his friends are. Because look at that. There's herding grass all around. And that's what you usually see for, you know, all these weeds. You don't just have one, you have a whole bunch of them. Same with the yellow star thistle, same with the milk thistle. With most of what you see here, all the little plants here are invasive. There's some good native trees and such, but all the little ones are invasive flowers. Okay, if you guys want to turn on your cameras, you're, um, we're finished at this time with our videos, and we'd love to see your shining faces. And if you have any questions or comments, I love how Marav all of a sudden when we walked to this other area said, oh, I have to correct myself here <laughs> about the harding grass. Yeah, it was funny to see where they all came from. There were so many of them. But I mean, there were so many weeds of so many different kinds. Most of the little plants we saw, like the shrubs and, and grasses and, you know, most of these little plants were all non-native. But then the larger plants are mostly native, other than the fig tree that we mentioned earlier. Um, there's some native trees there, and those are really important because they support all the different uh, native species, the insects that eat them and birds that would eat them. Even though, uh, I mean, some creatures would actually use weeds as well. So the yellow star thistle, which is, I mean, it's not, even a question it's a really bad weed but uh, the seeds are eaten by different birds and many insects pollinate it so it is used by some insects there are very few insects that can eat it and that's why they can spread so widely because there's just not much that can control them uh, we did actually see one of the biological control agents so uh, a few different species of weevil very small beetles were released some years ago and we saw one of the species there uh, so it's a little beetle that uh, uh, develop on the thistle, on the seed head. But as I think we mentioned there, they don't do it fast enough because there's so many <laughs> thistles everywhere. I can actually bring up that picture of it. Um, there's a question for you, Marav. 
<laughs> yes, it's my sunfish, <laughs> which I really like. And there's a giant squid there somewhere. Right next to it, there's a giant squid. I think everyone needs a sunfish. Yeah, so this is one of the weevil species. And I think this is the less common one. There's one that we see more often, um, but this is the one we saw. So this is the hairy one, which is kind of cute. It is very hairy. Rob, did you want to maybe talk a little bit more about milkweed and, um, oh, yeah. and some of their, their plant communities? Yeah, so one of my favorite things in the summer is looking at milkweed because you know there's not much out there right you go out and it's so dry it's so hot there's not too much activity but if you know where to look then you, you'd find stuff and milkweed is such a great place to look for different things uh, because there are not that many plants that are in bloom right now um, so milkweed would attract many kind of pollinators and that's why i created these different uh uh, flyers with photos of pollinators and other things so you could find uh, yeah awesome uh, different species of butterflies some of them are amazing like that clear wing uh, in the in the left area uh, but then lots of different bees including the non-native honeybee but many of our native bees would pollinate milkweed and then different wasps like the large uh, tarantula hawks um, that are often found in Coyote Valley and then lots of other beautiful wasps and flies and many different kinds of uh, pollinators, but then also predators that would come to eat these pollinators. So that's when we see the crab spiders, like we, we saw two different kinds when we were there. Um, you often see green link spider, which is another really cool spider that is often hiding in these flowers. Uh, jumping spiders, like the one we see here. Um, yeah, this is the green link spider. It's a gorgeous spider. And later on, they lay their uh, egg sacs in, in the flowers, like hidden inside the flowers. Uh, yeah, really gorgeous spiders. And then you can see the crop spider next to it. And then many ants would come and visit these flowers also to get some nectar. And in addition to all those creatures, there are different herbivores that feed on the milkweed itself, like monarch caterpillars but also different bugs. Uh, there's the little, uh, the small milkweed bug, the large milkweed bug, and then um, all sorts of other creatures. There's actually a whole book about milkweed creatures. Some of them are found in our area. I think most of them are in the East Coast, but still it's a really nice book with uh, a lot of information about the biology of the different species. I like it. Uh, and there's some overlap with what you may find here. So anyway, so this is kind of fun. You can go and, and look at the milkweed a little bit from far away. So you won't disturb the pollinators and you can watch them and then you can get closer and look for these different predators and um, different insect that you might find on the milkweed. And then if you have a good camera, you could take photos of these creatures. And sometimes you'll find something really cool. Uh, Milkweed has a special way of uh, pollination. So the pollen inside the flowers is not just like uh, basically like regular flowers where you see, you know, little, you, you could actually see the grains of pollen, uh, especially with a microscope, but you could see clusters of pollen on the flowers. Uh, they are actually encapsulated in milkweed and uh, closely related species and also in um, another family of flowers I'll remember in a second. Uh, so they're encapsulated in something called pollinia. And what the pollinator needs to do is basically slide their leg into a slit in the flower, and then they get these little sticky capsules attached to their legs. When it works, sometimes it doesn't work and then it just gets stuck. And you see a bee flying like that, trying to get loose out of that flower. And then, uh, so if you ever took photos of pollinators on milkweed, take a closer look at these photos, especially the larger pollinators like the wasps and the bees, but some of the butterflies as well. You could see the pollinia stuck on their legs and it's, it's amazing. 
So it's just a different system of pollination. Thanks for well, sharing. Well, it Rob. is exciting. Yes. Yeah. And there's plenty of milkweed plants. Yeah, in that area near the visitor center. And is this flyer that you created that I shared on the BioWoods.club website? Uh, I don't remember. I'll have to check. <laughs> it could be. But there and are a few Rob flyers that you could uh, download from the website with goals, which would be the next exciting things for us to do um, beginning like late July and into August and September, October will be goal season again, which of course we are all looking forward to. So we have some golf flyers and... Are you gonna do goal week again? I hope so, yeah. I need to figure out uh, time. So last year I just really decided, okay, let's do it in two weeks. But then it got so big, we had people joining from 15 different states, I think. And I don't remember how many countries. And for them, you know, the timing wasn't exactly great. So we might need to do it a bit earlier. So we need to figure out a time that would work for different states um, where plants, you know, are still in good shape to have stuff on them and not covered with snow. Um, like very early October when we did it, I think. So yeah, you'll have to join one of our next biolitzes to learn about galls because that's one of the things we'll be looking for. Uh, we'll have a late event, late in July, uh, biolitz in Allen Rock Park, which is always a great location. And then a different one in August. And coming to one of the bio blitzes would be the easiest way to get your hands on one of those fabulous flyers that you would get to take home and explore your galls and milkweeds and whatever else. So this was the gall week um, observation list from around the, the globe. So you can see some people in Europe and South Africa and then different parts of the United States as well. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to see how it's spread out, you know, to different people and people got very excited about it. It was, it was fun. Does anyone have any last comments or questions that they'd like to share before we sign off? Uh, just one thing. Yes, sir. Um, next year, springtime, April, go down the Coyote Creek Trail. And if we get enough rain, the wildflowers should be awesome. Uh, right around the model air aircraft sky park, you get a whole bunch of lupins along the trail. And then farther along by the uh, eucalyptus rest area, uh, that whole hillside, that whole field there, it's a big, big field there. It gets, it's like solid poppies. It just turns orange. It's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Ron. It, it is pretty amazing. And, and we do try to host bio blitzes in that area during the springtime. So we hope that you'll come out to those. All right. Thanks everyone for participating and I uh, hope you enjoyed the videos. They'll be up on uh, our YouTube website, the individual ones, as well as the recorded one with the questions and answers included. Thank you.